Welcome to our Invasive Species webinar series. Today is part four, Invasive Animals. I am Dr. Katherine Clements and Wilma Holly is also here uh, to co-present with me. So I grew up in Western New York. I spent a lot of my time as a teen out in nature and that just transitioned into, uh, into doing a degree in environmental science. So my bachelor's degree is from University of Buffalo in environmental science and I did a lot of education after I graduated and then decided to spend about 15 or more years um, becoming a physician and then practicing as a physician. After that time, I really just was wanting to return to environmental education. So in 2017, I started my job here with University of Florida IFAS Extension in Sarasota County. And I'm the ecology and natural resources educator here. And so I spend a lot of time uh, doing programs like this uh, about wildlife, about invasive species, about natural areas, plants, and all sorts of education for young and old. Uh, I have lived for about 20 years in a state park, which has just been a phenomenal experience. And just a few weeks ago, we actually transitioned from that, um, but we had the opportunity to bring our children and a whole bunch of animals up within Oscar Shearer State Park here in Sarasota County. So that's a little bit about me, and I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Wilma Holly, who will introduce herself, and then she's gonna start off our presentation for us today. Okay, hello, my name is Wilma. I'm with the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program here in Sarasota County, and I started that program in Pinellas County many years ago before I ever moved to Sarasota County. Um, I had an environmental program in, um, in an elementary school teaching all kinds of environmental education programs. It's a lot of fun working with the little kids and teaching them stuff. And some days I'd say, oh, let's do something different today. And oh, can't we pull weeds today? And I'm like, well, yeah, you can pull weeds. So, but we did a lot of different programs there. Um, I grew up on a, a dairy farm in New York State. So both of us are originally from New York State. Um, and I just always have loved being outdoors and doing stuff with animals and seeing all kinds of um, plants and all that. So it, it works out that I was able to get a nice job and doing stuff that I really enjoy. And that snake is Maisie, my, my pet snake. <laughs> So um, just in case people aren't aware, I think a lot of you have been in some of our programs before and you know what extension is, but some people aren't. Um, all the counties in Florida have an extension office or um, they might be combined with another county if they're a small county, but um, all the counties are, it's a partnership between their county, the University of Florida and the USDA. And the university does all the research, but um, some of the resources that people need locally might be different in different areas of the state. So as counties, we provide the information that people need through community initiatives and some of the classes we teach like this and other outreach and volunteer opportunities. And there's a lot of um, practical education involved with it to, to try to help the residents and, and anybody really to um, build a better future for themselves. And all these programs are Part of our extension here, some counties are a little smaller and they aren't able to have quite as many um, people. I'm, like I said, in the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, the first highlighted and, and um, Catherine, Dr. Catherine is in the Ecology and Natural Resources, but we have all these other programs here too. Um, we're a very fortunate county to have some of these programs because um, there's a couple of them um, that we're the only county that has. So, um, these are some of the, the programs that are different um, groups, you know, some of the groups each that are part of our extension office, um, school gardens, sustainable communities, partners, Lake Watch, Energy Upgrade, Florida Waters, Sea Grant, Family and Consumer Sciences, 4-H is a huge part of um, extension, Florida Microplastics, the Family Nutrition Program, so all this green business, all these are part of what we do. So we're gonna, um, this is kind of our, our agenda today. We're gonna go through some definitions and impacts. And then Dr. Catherine's gonna talk about invasive animals 
And then we're gonna um, tell us some of the things that you can do to help alleviate the problems. So um, back in June, 2020, the um, Journal of Extension came up with these um, invasive species terminology. And we've been using invasive species terminology for years, but different groups would start using different um, terms. We realized that people were getting the wrong idea on, on what some of the stuff meant. So um, a native species is a species that occurs naturally in a geographical area. And then non-native does not occur naturally in that specified geographic area. And if it's introduced, it's a species that was brought into an area, sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally by humans. And if it becomes established, it's a species that becomes self-sustaining in a geographic area. It has a reproducing population in a geographic area and it doesn't need human intervention to be reproducing. And it applies to both native and non-native species. And then um, invasive, there's three criteria. And if you don't have all of them, then it's not generally considered invasive. So one, it's non-native to a specified area. It was introduced by humans, as we said, either intentionally or unintentionally. And um, the third one is it can cause environmental or, well, it does cause environmental or economic harm or harm to humans in some other way, generally by health reasons. A nuisance species is an individual or group of individuals of a species that cause management issues or property damage. It presents a threat to public safety or is an annoyance. And this can apply to both native and non-native species. And sometimes when we think of um, a species like grapevine, that is a native species, but it can become a nuisance. The same with Virginia creeper and some of those plants um, that, that we don't really want in our yard but they're, they're only a nuisance. They're not considered invasive because they're native. And then rain change, um, sometimes a species current or existing range can grow, it can shrink or it can shift over time. It can happen to both native and non-native species and it doesn't need human assistance for that to happen. And two of the species, um, coyote and armadillo, and actually in um, Texas, the um, Muscovy duck has, has moved into Texas. So that's part of its native range. But here in Florida, that's an invasive species. So um, the, the rain change is a naturally occurring event. So a naturalized plant or animal a non-native plant or animal that does not need human help to reproduce and maintain itself over time in an area where it is not native. Even though their offspring reproduce and spread naturally without human help, naturalized plants do not over time become native. And that's a lot of people think they do. Um, member, they don't become native members of the local plant community. And these are some other terms that are often used, and that's why the Journal of Extension came up. It, it was um, agents and, and um, specialists that came up with those terms because we've heard all of these terms. And in fact, I've probably used some of them myself, try not to anymore because since they, they did that and trying to um, make the terminology all the same, but alien, foreign, introduced, non-indigenous, exotic, these can have, um, cultural connotations that are, aren't acceptable. And they mean the same thing generally, but they can be misinterpreted. Um, so, and then it's important to remember that not all non-native plants or animals are invasive. There's a lot of each that, that are really okay to have around, but it's, it's the invasive ones that we're really worried about. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes from the National Park Service because um, some exotics are capable of hybridizing with native plant relatives, and this is animals too, resulting in unnatural changes to a plant's genetic makeup. Still others contain toxins that may be lethal to certain animals. Exotic organisms have been referred to as biological pollution 
In some cases, exotic plant invaders are driving our rare species closer to extension, extinction. And like I said, um, that can be plants or animals, but that they were referring to animals or plants when they did this quote. And so some of the impacts of invasive plants and animals. Um, the problem, everyone is moving here. Florida is a good place to be. Of the 4,900 identified plant species in Florida, 1,500 are non-native plant species. That's 31%. But invasive plants represent only 4% of the total number of plant species, but they compromise comprise 33% of the total plant biomass growing in Florida. That's huge. They're, they're, um, that's why they're such a problem because they take over such huge areas. Plus there's 500 plus non-native fish and wildlife species in Florida and thousands of non-native insects, mites, nematodes, fungi, and microbes. So you can see where this can is uh, such a big problem. Um, it's easy access, no borders. There's 85% of the non-native plants in the U.S. come through the port of Miami. Um, 25,000 plants introduced every year purposely or inadvertently. We have some of the largest ports in the country and we also have a huge aquarium landscape, nursery and forest trade. And prior to 1940, most non-native animals were introduced unintentionally via cargo ships starting in the 1970s exotic pet trade um, when the exotic pet trade became more popular. One study attributes 84% of the introductions to the pet trade with 25% traced to a single importer. That's a lot. Um, the problem, non-natives love Florida. I mean, that's easy to understand why. Um, we have a tropical or a subtropical climate in some areas. Vast agricultural holdings. There's a lot of out-of-state landowners in the seasonal population, and many of those people, the um, out-of-state landowners in the seasonal population, especially, don't understand the threat of invasive species. They see a pretty plant, and they go, "Oh, I got to have this in my yard," and and that that can be part of the problem, and and that's easy to happen. I, it's happened to me before, so um, I I can understand it, but it's very very important to start learning what they are, what the animals and the plants are that are invasive and, and not contribute to the problem. And then there's a greater urban wildland interface with more and more people moving in over, uh, what is it, 100 people a day moving in, Catherine? Um, th there's so many people moving in, so more and more of the wildland is being used, changed to urban area and a huge wildland interface so that those, those spaces are becoming invaded with more and more animals and plants. And then animals in the non-native pet trade in the black market or unintended release. So there's, there's um, invasions that way um, where I guess sometimes people just don't care. Um, and they spread rapidly. There's fast growth. They have really rapid reproductive cycles, so lots of generations and high fecundity. Um, lots of offspring, behavior plasticity, which means there's a tolerance to a wide range of conditions. It may be a generalist or an opportunist. They can take um, heat, cold, um, dry, wet. I mean, all these things contribute to that tolerance and they can grow, grow almost anywhere. And they have a lack of their native predators. And so there's no diseases or anything um, killing some of them off and keeping them under control. And so that's a huge part of the problem. So some of the impacts, invasive non-native organisms are one of the greatest threats to the natural ecosystems of the U.S. and are destroying America's natural history and identity. These unwelcome plants, insects, and other organisms are disrupting the ecology of natural ecosystems, displacing native plant and animal species and degrading our nation's unique and diverse biological resources. And that's the National Park Service. So the dangers, they outcompete native species and that's where some of that biological pollution comes in. They dramatically impact ecosystems and their balance. They throw everything out of, out of whack and they may push threatened species to extinction, which we mentioned, and they may harbor parasites or diseases. And 
those can infect native species or humans. And I think Catherine, Dr. Catherine will be telling you about one of those that's happening with some of the snakes and they're very difficult and expensive to control. And it costs an amazing amount of money to the United States economy. It's estimated that 120 billion was spent in 2005 um, and Florida alone spends millions of dollars every year. Um, zebra mussels invaded the U.S. waters and have caused millions of dollars of damage by occluding pipes. And they're, they're a huge problem right now um, with Florida and, and a lot of other states as well. I just recently saw a picture of a, a floating mat that somebody had on a lake and it was covered in zebra mussels. I mean, thick, like an inch thick, the whole mat was covered. Um, and then brown tree snakes have been implicated in the decline of native forest birds and the modern extinction, extinction of at least 10 species in Guam. And invasive species have contributed directly to the decline of 42% of the threatened and endangered species in the United States. So it's not just something that we, people make up to try to get people not to buy non-native species. Um, invasive species is a huge problem. So just as a reminder, the, the requirements for something to be an invasive species, it's non-native to a specified geographic area. It was introduced by humans intentionally or unintentionally, and it, it causes environmental or economic harm or harm to humans. All right. And then I'm going to take over from here. And actually, Wilma, there's a thousand people a day moving into Florida. A thousand, okay. I knew it was some big number. Yeah. Can you believe that though? Like, I don't even know where a thousand people a day are going to go. And, and that's people that are moving here to live, not people that are coming here to vacation. So um, that's why we have all of this encroachment or increased wildland urban interface. Uh, and that becomes a problem as Wilma talked about, both in terms of if you plant things in your backyard and you back up against a preserve or a wildland area, things are likely to move from your backyard into nature. Um, but also if a pet gets released either intentionally or unintentionally, uh, then that pet is likely to be able to get into wildland areas too. Uh, so it's also um, increases our fire risk as well. So lots of reasons why that increased wildland to urban interface um, becomes a little bit of an issue. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about this graphic that you see on your screen called the invasion curve. And so this is a really great graphic depiction of how to think about invasive species and also how to sort of recognize the amount of risk or threat they provide depending on where they are in this population curve. So the bottom axis um, or axis is um, time. And then this axis is area occupied by the um, species that has been listed as invasive. So at the beginning, of course, um, at the beginning of time, the species is not here yet and there isn't a population or area occupied. So at this point, early on in the invasion curve, we are in the prevention mode. So um, our example for this here in Florida, I'm going to say is still the zebra mussel. So we do see zebra mussels starting to be in Florida. They are obviously a huge issue up north and in the Great Lakes. And if we were up north in the Great Lakes area giving this presentation, we'd probably ta be talking asset-based protection for the zebra mussel. Um, but what we want for some of these species that we know are invasive in other areas and now we're starting to be concerned about them in our state is we want to try to prevent um, them getting into our state or at the very least eradicate them if they get here so that we don't end up being um, in the situation that they are in the Great Lakes with zebra mussels. So um, just recent, well, not all that recently, probably like a few months ago now, the uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission, also known as the FWC, released a news um, brief about the zebra mussel. They were wanting people to be watching out for them and to possibly stop buying these things called moss balls. So moss, M-O-S-S. -S, 
So like basically balls of moss and people during COVID apparently got really into these balls of moss for their aquariums. And they look sort of cool. They're like this green floating ball of moss in your aquarium. And I guess um, aquarium lovers really like these um, moss balls. But what we found were that there were actually zebra mussels being carried in these moss balls. And then of course, if you clean your aquarium or you dump your aquarium out, then you are potentially releasing those zebra mussels into our Florida waterways. So um, the FWC started an educational campaign trying to educate people to uh, not purchase these or at the very um, least to be careful about how they clean their aquarium. So that's an example of a species that at least in Florida is still in this early detection rapid response phase of preventing it from becoming a problem. All right, and then so they're right, they're right about here, right on that line between prevention and eradication, because we know that there are some in Florida. So eradication is just what it says is at this point, the species population, the area occupied by the population is still low and the amount of resources, including time, money, equipment, et cetera, required to eradicate the species is also still low. So um, this is, if you can't prevent it from getting here and it's already here and we know it's gonna become a problem, then eradication is our next step. And our main example that I use for that is the giant African land snail. Uh, it was introduced into Florida and uh, it was a huge threat to our crops. These snails are really giant, hence their name, and they can eat a lot. And so when they were found here in Florida, there was a huge movement to eradicate them. And that has been a successful eradication, which is great. As we move further along in time, if that species is allowed to continue to populate and occupy more area, um, we're going to move into more of the containment aspect along this curve. And that's when the species is rapidly increasing in distribution and abundance. There's lots of populations. It's probably spreading in terms of geographic area. And now we're going to be in a process of containment. And we're just trying to manage it well enough to contain it to the places where it is actually occurring. Um, and so I would say our example for this one, I'm going to say the tegu right now is an example of that. Um, and I'm going to show you a picture of a tegu in a little while if you don't know what they are. Uh, and tegus have recently been um, regulated more by the FWC. I'm also going to talk about that um, towards the end of the presentation today. But tegus are causing a huge problem in some areas of our state. They're not so much a problem here in our county, but they are a big problem in like, I believe it's Pasco and maybe Pinellas, that sort of area, maybe Polk and Hillsboro. Um, there are some uh, populations that are breeding up there and causing problems. So there's still an opportunity to contain them and hopefully not get to asset-based protection. So when we're at asset-based protection, this is where the species population has really um, increased quite a bit and also the geographic area it's occupying or ranging in is quite a bit larger. And we're sort of beyond the hope of eradication and containment at this point. And so when we're in asset-based protection, we are just trying to manage that invasive species um, to the best of our ability and save um, mostly our wildlands. So um, I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna switch to plants for a minute and just talk about Brazilian pepper tree um, or old world climbing fern. But if we want an animal example, it would be the Burmese python. I don't think that we're ever going to contain or eradicate Burmese pythons. They're very stealthy. Um, they live in areas where it's really hard to find them here in Florida, like in the vastness of the Everglades, um, in areas that are difficult to get into, let alone to find them. Um, so we have a number of things that mostly the FWC is doing in order to try to protect um, the harm that that species is doing. And it's the same with old world climbing fern. Old world climbing fern was covering over the tree islands of the Everglades and basically killed 
pulling the plants, the native plants underneath or within that tree island, which completely shifts the ecosystem. It does not, um, many of our invasive plants just do not provide the habitat needs for our wildlife, as well as they can actually um, shift the chemistry of the soil and many other things that can change the ecosystem completely. And so what we're trying to do in this asset-based protection is really just try to save, um, especially our more natural area. Sometimes it's too expensive to even be trying to take, especially something like Brazilian pepper from every single place in our state uh, because it covers so much of our state. So we're gonna focus on the more important environmentally sensitive or environmentally important areas to protect. So that's sort of um, what this is showing. And unfortunately here in Florida, for all the reasons Wilma just mentioned, we do have a number of both plant and animal species, um, more so plant, but um, in this category of asset-based protection. So part of why we do this education is so that you all can start learning about this issue and learning some of the species that are part of this issue and learning what you can do to maybe help um, so that we can try to stay more commonly in this prevention and eradication zone for any new species and not allow them to get to this level where we're in asset-based protection. Because of course, asset-based protection takes a lot of resources as well. So it's quite costly. Um, as Wilma just mentioned, uh, some of the prices, I was gonna give you another one. Hold on, let me pull it up really quick. Um, so the bacterium that is believed to cause citrus greening disease cost Florida's citrus industry $4.54 in lost revenues and 8,300 lost jobs over a five production season. So five um, seasons of production. That's a huge amount of money and jobs that were lost um, because of citrus greening. And so that's where, when we're talking asset-based protection, we're talking a lot of money either lost um, or and or a lot of money being put into trying to manage that situation. All right, so that is all of our general introduction that we do in every one of these webinars in our series. Now we're gonna get to the unique part of this particular webinar, which is where we're gonna cover our invasive animals. So I'm gonna do a few invertebrates first. We are actually going to add a new webinar to this series in a couple months where we're gonna have um, one of our agents, Carol Wyatt Evans, talk completely about invertebrates for a whole webinar. Uh, but I'm just gonna hit on a couple and uh, you may hear about them again in a few months if you join us again. But these are some of the ones that I think about because they affect the natural areas that I work in. So Mexican bromeliad weevil. This little guy is all known as the evil weevil. Uh, so on your screen here, you see one of our beautiful Tillandsia species. And this evil weevil um, actually is impacting two of our largest native bromeliads, the Tillandsia utriculata and the Tillandsia fasciculata. And they are both now considered endangered um, because of some of the destruction that this weevil causes. So the weevil is native to Central and South America and was first found in Florida in 1989 at a Fort Lauderdale bromeliad nursery. So it came in with bromeliads that were coming into the nursery trade for sale. Um, there, it has three to four continuous generations per year in Florida. So once again, it's breeding quite often. And all life cycle stages of this weevil utilize the plant. So adults and larvae will eat the leaves of the bromeliad. Eggs are laid in slits on leaves. So the female will actually like basically cut a little slit or hole in the leaf of the plant to lay her eggs. And then the larva will burrow down into the center of the plant stem. So that's right in here um, to pupate, which is usually fatal to the plant. And so um, these actually create sort of large pupa. Um, they're really, I've seen pupa like this big. Um, so that's the stage before the adult stage. And so 
when they pupate in the leaf tissue at the base of the plant, that almost always kills the plant. You'll see the plant sort of yellowing in its leaves. Often the plant will fall out of a tree. Um, and so that is part of why these beautiful, and you know, this is such a Florida scene right here. And unfortunately, uh, we are not seeing as many of these giant cardinal air plants as we were in the past. Uh, so here are some pictures of that weevil. And this is the larva stage here. Uh, there is a native bromeliad weevil, which uh, is red with black spots. So this one that is red with the yellow lines, that's the evil weevil. That's the non-native invasive one. Um, but the native one is red with black spots. And then as is true in many cases, the native beetle and the native plant have co-evolved over thousands of years. So the native weevil does not cause anywhere near as much destruction to our bromeliads as the non-native weevil. And so when Wilma was talking about how when non-natives are um, introduced and then sometimes become invasive, often it's because they don't have a disease or a predator that um, will keep them at bay. Whereas many of our native plants, animals, weevils, all have co-evolved together to sort of keep populations stable. Um, so in, um, in Florida, we actually have released a parasitoid fly from Honduras after studying it for many years to make sure it wasn't going to cause other problems in our ecosystem. But that parasitoid fly will actually kill the weevil larva. Um, and it seems to more specifically kill the weevil larva of this non-native evil weevil. Um, in studies, fatality rates were anywhere from 5 to 67 percent when they actually um, when they actually looked at how often it killed the beetles in their native state of, or in their native range of Honduras. Uh, so we do sometimes have these options. This is called biocontrol, when you use another biological organism to try to control the invasive organism. And those things are studied for a minimum of 10 years, usually closer to 20 years before they're released into our ecosystem, because we certainly don't wanna release another non-native that's gonna become a problem. And I'm gonna talk about some other biocontrols. Oh, I'm not sure if I am. If not, I will try to cycle back and talk about a different biocontrol, just to give you another example. Okay, so let's talk about another invasive um, insect. This is the red bay ambrosia beetle. And um, this beetle carries a fungus within its saliva that causes something called laurel wilt disease. So uh, the red bay tree is a beautiful native tree, um, more often found in our natural areas in our state. And it is part of the laurel family. And so we are losing a lot of our red bays, which are Persia borbonia, to this laurel wilt disease. Um, so what happens is the adult ambrosia beetle bores into um, trees that are in the Persia genus. It infects the host tree with fungal spores that are carried sort of basically, it's got little sacs in its jaw where it carries um, the fungal spores. Those little sacs are called mycangia. And the fungus, as it gets into the tree, grows and disrupts the flow of water and nutrients in the tree's vascular tissue. So it's a little bit like when um, humans get atherosclerosis and we get plaque in our arteries and then we can't transport our blood, which carries our oxygen and nutrients and all that other good stuff as well. So it's the same thing basically happening to trees when this fungus starts to grow in its vascular tissue. And then what you see initially is you'll see wilting or turning brown of like a couple leaves and then you'll see an entire branch turn brown and then eventually the tree will usually die. So both the adult and larval form of beetles will feed on the fungus. So they have a, 
um, symbiotic relationship with the fungus where the fungus is actually their food. So that's partly why they carry it and this whole process happens. But unfortunately for our Persia genus of trees, um, this is a fatal situation. Uh, the nymph form feeds on the leaves, um, causing gall formation. And gall is like an immune response of the plant to something, in this case, the nymph feeding on the leaves and the leaf will create all this extra tissue and you'll see all these like crazy weird looking um, sort of like tumors on the leaves. We call those galls and so that's another way that you can know that the beetle is around. Um, so this red bay ambrosia beetle is native to India, Japan, Myanmar, and Taiwan and it was um, first introduced to Georgia in 2002 and it was first found in Florida in 2005. This map here shows you sort of the movement of it. So orange is where it was first found. So in that county right there in Georgia, I know this map is sort of tiny. And then um, these are the years following that. The last one on this map is 2017 and it's a really light green. That one's probably this county over here. So you can see it sort of spread, these darker shades of green, it sort of spread throughout South Carolina, Georgia, Northern Florida, and then it has continued to spread and is now found in almost, and probably by now, every county of Florida, as well as throughout the Southeastern Plain. Um, one of the issues that I don't have on the slide about this is not only is it impacting our native trees in this genus, but another tree that is in the Persia genus is avocados. Avocados are Persia americana. And so we are seeing um, similar effects on our avocado trees. So if you like avocados, you really don't like this red bay ambrosia beetle because they are threatening our avocados. They're gonna end up increasing the price of our avocados, um, which are already pretty expensive. But researchers are working on solutions to this. We don't have a really great solution yet, but there is active research ongoing about this red bay ambrosia beetle. And then the last invertebrate I'm going to talk about so that I don't steal too much of Carol's thunder, but many of um, the apple snails that are currently in Florida are non-native and are um, channeled apple snail. Sorry, the channeled apple snail is the non-native one. So all of these ones in red are non-native and then Florida apple snail is our native. And the channeled apple snail is the one that I see most commonly. And you can see it's quite large. It's actually larger than our native one. Um, it also makes more eggs. So if we look over here, our native snail eggs are here, the ones listed as D. And the channeled apple snail is C, it's this one. So um, they are sort of bubblegum pink, whereas our native apple snail eggs are more whitish. And there will tend to be a really, really large sort of conglomeration of these eggs. As you can see here, um, any of the apple snail eggs usually are laid on um, grasses or plants that are um, emerging from the water line or right close to the water line. And so if you see these bright pink bubblegum colored um, eggs, if you're out kayaking or something like that, you can remove them with your kayak paddle and that will help decrease the population of these channeled apple snails. They also will eat our Florida apple snails. So they have multiple ways that they are threatening the population of our native Florida apple snail. I will say this is an interesting story in the invasive species world where um, what we have seen that's actually positive since we've seen an uh, increase in population of the invasive channeled apple snail is we have seen um, increased population of both our snail kites and our limpkins. Uh, so I can remember a time where it was very rare to see limpkins in Mayaka River State Park, and now you see and hear them all, they're everywhere there. And so um, they have been able to adapt to eat the channeled apple snail, and so that has provided greater food um, for some of our species like the limpkin and the snail kite. 
Uh, this, is, this is sort of an unusual invasive species story because most commonly invasive species uh, do not provide food or other habitat requirements um, as well as our native plants and animals do. Okay, so we're going to talk about her petafauna. Uh, this is, in terms of the animal world, her petafauna is probably one of the greatest um, impacts that we're seeing in the invasive animal species uh, world. So Florida has seen the introduction of at least 180 species of non-native amphibians and reptiles. That's what her petafauna refers to, both amphibians and reptiles more than anywhere else in the world. So this is just, you know, everyone loves coming to Florida. There's a big exotic pet trade here in Florida. And so um, there's just been a lot of introduction. It's very easy for many of the amphibians and reptiles to be able to live here um, and be able to exist out in the wild. Whereas if they were somewhere up north where there were, there was more, um, more extreme seasonality, they would not be able to survive out in the wild during the winter, for instance, whereas here often can. So research suggests that one in three introduced herpetofaunal species becomes established in Florida. So if there's 180, let's just, let's just go with these numbers, even though these numbers are a little old, they might be even bigger now, but let's just go with these numbers. If there are at least 180 species that have been introduced just of amphibians and reptiles into our state. And research is saying that one in three of those actually has a breeding population in the wild and is self-sustaining their population. That's at 60 different amphibians and reptiles that are, are actually breeding on their own in the wild here that are not native to our, our area. So that's actually quite a bit. So here's an um, example from uh, research that was done. Um, actually, it's been done over a number of years, and they recently updated it in 2016. So this shows you different um, taxa in the herpetofauna, so salamanders, frogs, turtles. Um, and the first column here is the number of native species in that taxa. And then the last column is the number of non-native established. So maybe they aren't quite invasive yet, but they definitely have established themselves with a breeding population in the wild. So um, what is really interesting to look at is the lizards. So we have 16 lizards that are native to Florida, and we have eight that are not native and are actively breeding and have an established population in our state. That's three times the number of native lizards. Um, so that's concerning. We're going to talk about lizards in just a few slides and um, they can create all sorts of havoc uh, with some of our threatened species especially as well as just our you know other native species here in our state. So let's talk about amphibians and then I'll circle back around to the lizards. So Cuban tree frogs, I bet almost all of you on this call, unless you don't live in the South, have seen a Cuban tree frog. Uh, it is probably if you live in a residential area and maybe even if you live in a more natural area, uh, you probably have these around your house. So these are pictures of a Cuban tree frog that was in my house at Oscar State Park. And I know I have them at my new house because I've heard them. So um, this is a pretty decent sized frog usually. So you can see here, for instance, this was my daughter's um, running shoe. And so you can get a sense of size of this particular frog. Um, you can see uh, this color variation. Um, it's light because it's in with light colored things and then it jumped over here to the wall. And so these can shift their shading a little bit and can be anywhere from sort of light beige all the way up to green and dark brown. Um, so they are native to Cuba, hence their name, the Cayman Islands and the Bahamas. They were introduced throughout the Caribbean in Hawaii and in Florida. And there's possibly an isolated population in southeastern Texas as well. Our earliest records um, of introduction indicate that they came in in 1920s into the Florida Keys, 
probably in shipping crates and uh, they eat all sorts of actually good things we might want them to eat like beetles, roaches, spiders, and other small invertebrates. But they also eat small frogs, lizards, and snakes. So they are potentially eating our native frogs as well. They are much larger than our native frogs. Um, so if you see a frog that is, you know, four or five inches like this one was, um, it is not a native frog. It's going to be a Cuban tree frog. They are um, habitat generalists, meaning they can live in all different types of habitat. So we can see them in urban areas, agricultural and natural areas. Here's a picture of another Cuban tree frog that was at my house. Uh, so here it's been captured. Um, it was actually sitting on our garbage can. So here it's sitting on our garbage cans. This one was huge. This one was like almost as big as my entire hand. Um, so one of the ways you tell them from our native frogs besides just their size is take a look at the toe pads on these guys. So the Cuban tree frogs have much larger toe pads and they're really bulgy eyes compared to our native tree frogs. Um, they are sexually dimorphic. So the female is larger than the male. They have generally rough or warty skin, more like what you would expect with a toad. And as I mentioned, they can um, be very variable in their coloration. They also have a sticky secretion that is irritating to our mucous membranes. So if you touch one, don't touch your eyes or your mouth until you wash your hands because that secretion on their skin can actually be irritating to us. They can cause damage to transformers, water pumps, drains, or HVAC units. They like to get into things. Um, so you might want to consider, depending on your level of comfort, you might want to consider humane euthanasia for these guys if you feel comfortable capturing them and putting them into the refrigerator and letting them cool down naturally. They'll sort of go into um, just the slow metabolic state and then you would put them in your freezer um, so that then they basically freeze and die and then you can dispose of them. Uh, that will help our native frog population. These guys also make a huge mess. If you have them in your lanai or out on your deck, they also, um, they have quite large excrement that will make a mess all over stuff as well. So here's, this is one of the coolest wildlife pictures I feel like I've ever taken. I love this picture. Uh, this is what we call amplexus. So this is an example of sexual dimorphism in the Cuban tree frogs. And you can also see the variation in color as well. So this is not a mother and baby. This is actually the large green frog is a female Cuban tree frog. And the smaller one on top is a male Cuban tree frog. And so they are getting ready for the male to fertilize the female's eggs. Um, so actually I believe this was the same female that I showed you in the previous slide. Um, this, I saw them earlier in the day and wasn't able to catch them. And then I was able to catch her later. All right, let's talk about another um, amphibian that many of you have probably heard about on the news and are concerned about, especially if you have pets. This is the cane or bufo toad native to South and Central America. It has um, tan to more of a reddish brown or dark brown like we see in this picture or even gray body. Um, its back is marked with darker spots. It has a very typical toad look. It's very bumpy and warty. They live on the ground, they do not climb. So your Cuban tree frogs are gonna be like climbing all over. They'll climb on your windows, they'll climb on your house. Um, but our cane toads are going to be on the ground. They are going to be four inches or more. They're going to be quite large once they're adults. When they're young, they're very, they, they're very much smaller, of course, and they're very difficult to tell from our native toads. Um, so sometimes even the scientists that um, are herpetofauna specialists cannot tell the really young cane toads from our native toads. So it's usually recommended to not try to identify them or deal with young toads because we just can't tell. You want to, but if you find a larger toad, our, our native toads are like two and a half inches or smaller. So 
So if you see something bigger than that, it's most likely a cane toad, and then you would potentially want to dispose of it. Um, they do not have raised ridges on their heads. So they have like this eye ridge, but some of our native toads that are often mistaken with this guy have um, other ridging on their head. They do have triangular paratoid poison glands, and you can really see that here in this picture. This whole bump right here is where um, the poison is in this uh, toad. And they carry quite a large amount of poison compared to some of our smaller native toads that also have a paratoid poison gland that is small and does not impact um, our pets like this guy does. So the poison glands produce toxins that can kill small pets um, and make them very ill. So you do want to be really careful if you live in areas where these have been found. Um, you want to make sure that your, especially your pet dog, um, which is more likely to be the pet, although I guess your cat might play with these guys as well. You want to make sure that they don't come in contact with them. And if you think they have, you want to take your pet to the vet. Um, the poison is very viscous, so if it does get in your pet's mouth, you can your pet's, pet will probably foam, um, and you can try to get to sort of rinse out or wipe out the poison, but you still, it's hard to do, so you still need to get that pet to the vet immediately. Here's another picture, and once again, you can see that paratoid poison gland right there. Uh, so their diet is similar to Cuban tree frogs, but they may even consume small mammals when these cane tones are really large. Uh, they breed March to September, so they have a long breeding time, and their eggs are laid in long strings and are virtually indistinguishable from eggs of our native true toads. Once again, you can, um, if you do find one of these, you can choose to humanely euthanize it. Uh, you always want to try to grab either the Cuban tree frog or this toad with your hand either in a glove or in a plastic bag. So put a plastic bag over your hand, grab that species, and then turn the plastic bag inside out and zip it up. Um, once again, these can be confused with our native toads, uh, which are not a threat to our pets. Um, and so if you're not sure and you think it could be a native toad, you probably want to leave it alone. And then just to give you an indication of where these have been found, these are called, if you're not familiar with these types of maps, they're called range maps. And this is where we found vouchered species or vouchered examples of these species. So by vouchered, I mean we actually have an identified Cuban tree frog or cane toad, not just somebody's um, verbal report. There's actually been a specimen sent in that's been identified in these counties. So you can see the counties where, our cute, where cane toads have been found on the right-hand side of your screen. Our county, Sarasota County, is there, but we do not have a large cane toad population like they do in some of the counties closer to Tampa Bay. We have had a few cane toad specimens more in the eastern part of our county. So I have not encountered a large problem with them in Sarasota. Um, and then down here on the left-hand side, you can see the Cuban tree frog. Um, so few isolated populations in some of the other states, even way up here um, in the Northeast but you can see Cuban tree frog is almost throughout our entire state. All right, now we're gonna transition into reptiles. So um, this is an amazing picture that was given to me by uh, one of our customers that lives out in the Eastern part of Sarasota County. This is um, a giant Amazonian race runner, I believe is its common name. Its scientific name is Amoeba Amoeba. Uh, and these had not been vouchered or actually, once again, vouchered means that there's actual research or scientific identification of the species in the county. Um, so these had been found more in the like Miami-Dade area, but we now have a population in Eastern Sarasota County. They're absolutely beautiful lizards, um, but that doesn't mean we just want them populating our county. 
um, because our non-native, especially our invasive lizards are, and snakes are causing quite a problem in terms of um, often eating, for instance, gopher tortoise eggs. Uh, some of these lizards will climb trees like some of the iguanas and they'll eat scrub jay eggs as well as other bird eggs. So they are an ongoing threat to some of our not only native but also endangered native species. So general guidelines with lizards, if it's greater than 12 inches in length and it's not an alligator, then it is probably a non-native lizard. Whether or not it's invasive is another story, but still, if we're thinking about early detection, rapid response, and preventing some of these species from breeding out in the wild and establishing a population and eventually becoming invasive, we wanna be on the lookout for things that um, might have been released either intentionally or unintentionally. So um, once again, if it's greater than 12 inches in length and it's a lizard, but it's not an alligator, because of course alligators are native and they're much bigger than 12 inches. Um, or another thing to think about is if they have smooth scales with spots or a banded pattern, um, it is likely to be a non-native lizard. So here's one that's smaller. Um, but still non-native, a Cuban brown anole, and these are considered invasive. Uh, this is from Cuba, Bahamas, Cayman Islands. It was probably introduced back in the 1800s, um, once again in cargo, and is currently established throughout Florida. So I bet you, you've seen this all over as well. You've probably seen more of these than the Cuban tree frogs even. So they outcompete and out-eat our native species, which you see on the bottom of the slide there. Our native green anoles are just so beautiful. I actually need to add some pictures because I recently saw one outside my house at the state park and tried to get as many pictures as I could. I hadn't seen one in a few months and it's, you know, I only see one when I see it. So I don't know if it's the same one, but I never have seen more than one at a time um, near my house out there. So they're absolutely beautiful. They're emerald green. Um, but the Cuban brown anole will actually eat them. And so once again, we're seeing quite a decline in the native green anole population. Here's another lizard. This is one of the larger ones. So this is a black spiny tail iguana. Um, and you could probably find some better pictures. This is a picture I took, the very first one I ever saw. This was out at Shamrock Park in Sarasota County. Um, and this is a type of iguana, although it's different from the green iguanas that you might be more familiar with, um, and we're going to talk about those in just a second. But the black spiny tail iguana is the one in Sarasota County that we're having more issue with at this point. We're not finding a lot of green iguanas yet here. Um, so the black spiny tail is native to southern Mexico. It was first identified in 1978 in Dade County. It has established populations in Dade, Broward, Collier, Lee, and Charlotte counties, although Sarasota needs to be added into that because um, we have quite a problem with them in both Shamrock as well as Lemon Bay parks. Um, populations are confirmed breeding and self-sustaining for over 10 years and their range is expanding. They can get up to four feet in length. They are seen basking in the sun. So this one was on the riffraff, um, like the rock right before the intercoastal in Shamrock Park. And they do tend to like to be around areas where there is water. They like to go in amongst the rocks, but they also will live in the uplands and they'll use gopher tortoise burrows. Um, they, they are a little, whereas the green iguanas will just sort of lie there and not be bothered by humans that much, black spiny tails will run and hide when they see humans. So they're also sort of hard to capture. Um, they're very good climbers. So these are an example, I've seen them climbing up into the palm trees. So this is an example of a lizard that will eat scrub jay eggs as well as other bird eggs. So it feeds opportunistically on insects, lizards, fish, bird eggs, nestling birds. So it'll eat the baby birds as well. It'll eat hatchling sea turtles. Um, it'll eat the gopher tortoise eggs. So um, definitely impacting our native species. 
It will also use the burrow of some of our listed species. It'll use the burrows of the Florida burrowing owl and the burrows of gopher tortoises. In fact, I had a class out at Shamrock. Yes, it was Shamrock. I had a class at Shamrock Park um, before COVID and we had our FWC gopher tortoise biologist out there with us and we were scoping the gopher tortoise burrows um, and the first gopher tortoise burrow we scoped, there was not a gopher tortoise in it. There was a black spiny tail iguana in it. So if you're a gopher tortoise and all of a sudden this super large lizard is inhabiting your burrow, you're either going to move on or you're going to be stressed that you're not going to eat as well. You're not going to reproduce as well. So even if that gopher tortoise stays in its burrow, it may not reproduce that year or it may get sick because it's stressed and not eating as well. So all different implications of a lizard like this starting to um, inhabit and breed in an area where it isn't native to. And then here's the tegu that I mentioned before. This is an Argentine black and white tegu. There's other types of tegus as well, but the one that we're talking about is Argentine black and white. Um, I actually think these are like super amazing, beautiful looking lizards. But once again, just like with some of our invasive plants, they may be beautiful, but that doesn't mean they are not going to cause harm and disruption to our Florida ecosystems. So this tegu is native to South America. We think it was either escaped um, from being a pet or was released by the pet trade. It grows up to four to five feet long and they can be pretty aggressive. Um, they are not friendly lizards by any means. So, you know, often we have situations where people get things as pets and then are not able to care for them or not willing to care for them as they get bigger and larger. And there are ways you can, uh, you can move that pet along to a better home, uh, which I'm gonna talk about towards the end of the presentation because we really don't want these things just released out into nature. Um, so tegus, or at least this tegu is black and white with bands on its tail. Um, the young have greenish heads. They will eat fruit, vegetables. Once again, they'll eat eggs, they'll eat pet food and they'll eat small reptiles and mammals as well. In Florida, we have found them to be eating eggs of alligators, birds, tortoises, and turtles. So if you love your sea turtles, your gopher tortoises, your scrub jays, your other birds, um, this is not the, what we want um, eating the eggs of those animals. It will also use gopher tortoise burrows just like the spiny tailed iguana. We have confirmed breeding populations in Miami-Dade and Hillsborough County, so up in the Tampa Bay area as well. They lay approximately five eggs per clutch up to twice a year. So they don't, they don't reproduce extensively, um, but their lifespan is 15 to 20 years. So over the lifespan, they can reproduce or create quite, um, quite a sustaining population. They spend most of their time on land. They're often seen on roadsides or other disturbed areas, but they can swim and may submerge themselves for long periods of time. They're mainly active during the day and then will spend the colder months of the year in a burrow or undercover. And then here's our green iguana, uh, which you, if you've been in Florida, maybe you've seen one, but you've probably definitely heard about them. Um, especially here on the West Coast and further south in Florida. Uh, they have quite a large population. Here's a young one. They also were released or potentially escaped from the pet trade and are now established in South Florida. Uh, they eat valuable landscape plants. So these, these are more herbivorous lizards compared to the other lizards we just talked about but they're still gonna be eating a lot of plants. They make a huge mess. They will burrow under sidewalks, seawalls and foundations and their droppings are smelly and unsightly. And like um, many of our herpetofauna can carry salmonella. So I wanted to just tell you, this is a picture of a huge green iguana. Um, they are super cool looking. Uh, but I did want to tell you a little bit about the recent rules that are now in effect as of April 29th. So um, as of April 29th, the FWC is regulating a number of these invasive lizards 
um, more so than they had in the past. So they now require owners of tegus and green iguanas to apply for a free permit and to have their pets have basically a microchip. Um, and that's so if these are found, they can be traced back to the owner and returned to the owner. Uh, um, they're working with a variety of partners and have tagged nearly 150 tegus and green iguanas. Um, these events offer pet owners an opportunity to not only get the free microchip, but to also get their questions answered about the new permits that are required if you own one of these animals. Uh, there is one more that I know of that's being held and it's just in a couple days at the Lee County Domestic Animal Services down in Fort Myers. If you wanna get um, your questions answered about your permit, get your required permit in and get that required microchip for free. And then I think I'm gonna end our lizard discussion with a Nile monitor, uh, certainly quite a large lizard to end on. These guys are native to Africa uh, and we do have populations in Lee, Miami-Dade and Palm Beach counties. So at this point, they're more um, breeding in the Southern part of our state where of course uh, we have an even warmer climate. Uh, they were escaped or released from the pet trade and they are using canals in Southern Florida because they do prefer to be in water. They're sort of olive greenish to black with cream or yellow stripes on their jaw and back of their bodies as you see here. The tails are usually one and a half times the length of their body and they use that tail to swim and navigate through those waters. They are most active during the day and will be seen near the water either basking um, because all of these herpetofauna, all of our reptiles are uh, ectothermic, um, common word for that is cold-blooded. Uh, so they need to heat up their bodies or their blood um, by basking in the sun to increase their metabolism and get themselves moving for the day. So that's why you see a lot of these animals basking in the sun. Uh, they'll rest in trees or in the water and they can remain submerged for 15 to 25 minutes. Uh, they eat shellfish, insects, amphibians, reptiles, birds and eggs, and small mammals. Pretty much anything they want to eat that will fit in their mouth, that's what they'll eat. Um, there is unfortunately also a large population where burrowing owls are and they could even attack small pets and chickens. They lay anywhere from 12 to 60 eggs and they can grow up to six and a half feet and 18 pounds. So this is definitely one that uh, we don't wanna see increasing in population. Here's our range maps for where we have um, vouchered specimens of these different species. So we start on the left here with the black spiny tailed iguana. And as you can see, when you look at these maps, um, it's more likely that we see a lot of these ectothermic species sort of um, subsisting on their own in Southern Florida. And, you know, as our climate changes, we may be seeing them moving further into Central and Northern Florida and maybe even out of Florida. But for the most part, they're more concentrated in the Central and South portions of our state. So black spiny tailed iguana here, uh, black and white tegu here. And remember these don't these maps don't show us if there's just been one vouchered species or like a huge population of them. So we have the black, we have a vouchered species of black and white tegu from Sarasota County, but I don't believe we have a breeding population here. Uh, green iguana. So we're seeing the green iguana through most of peninsular Florida. Um, once again, I have seen a green iguana in Sarasota County. It was a while back and uh, they are not all that common here because it's a little too cold for them here still, but you can see they are throughout the state of Florida, but much more common. Like if you go to Sanibel, if you go down to um, Lee County and further south, you're going to see them. And then the Nile monitor we're seeing in more counties than I would like to imagine that we're seeing them here, but they're more um, a breeding population, more isolated right to the tip of the state. All right, let's talk a little bit about snakes as well. Um, this is a Burmese python on your screen. 
the general guidelines for um, what might make a snake non-native or what might help you identify it as a non-native is that they're going to be very large, greater than five feet long and heavy bodied. Now, I will tell you that our Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake can also be uh, that large. So I'm gonna show you on the next slide, a picture of the difference. Um, so it's not a large Diamondback or an Indigo. Um, our indigo snakes are native snakes. Uh, they are beautiful. I've only seen one um, on, uh, oh, I forget the name of the island. I can't believe that. Um, it's on the island near Pine Island. Uh, I saw one like 20 years ago and that's the only one I've ever seen in Florida. So indigos are native and they are actually endangered and they get quite large and heavy bodied but they are a very dark blackish blue snake like the name suggests. Um, so our non-native snakes are smooth with shiny scales. So look how shiny that Burmese python looks. And I'm gonna show you the difference with our rattlesnake in a minute. And they generally have bold patterns and are gonna be, you know, python, a boa, and anaconda are some of the groups of snakes that we're seeing in Florida that are non-native. So here's the difference between a native Eastern diamondback rattlesnake and an invasive Burmese python. So you can see our rattlesnake here, and these can get quite large. Um, right before we moved out of Oscar Shear State Park, there was about a five foot one in my backyard. I have a few hundred pictures. So next time I give this presentation, you'll get to see some of those pictures. It was actually eating a rabbit. So it was a large snake eating, you know, a not so small mammal. Um, so these can get very large. They can be very wide bodied or heavy bodied as well. But look at the difference. Yes, they have a bold pattern, but do you notice how we call this keeling, K-E-E-L, their scales are keeled, like the keel of a boat. And so they do not reflect light the way the smooth scales of the Burmese python does. So our native rattlesnake is not going to be shiny looking. It's going to have more of like a doll look to its scales. Um, and although it has bold patterns, it doesn't have quite the coloration that our Burmese python does. So I want to talk a little bit more about um, an issue with the Burmese python. So we, we hear about... Uh, the Burmese python is sort of like the poster child of invasive species in our state. And so we we hear a lot about that snake and the damage it's causing in the Everglades and um, the fact that there is uh, potentially a very decreased small mammal population in the Everglades. Um, we hear all about that. Um, but this is an issue with the Burmese python that maybe you haven't heard about that I just am fascinated by. So um, recently over the last couple of years, researchers from both University of Florida and Stetson University have been looking at parasites that are found in the body of the Burmese python. So these parasites are found in Burmese pythons in their native area in Asia. Um, so in their native area, the Burmese python has co-evolved with these parasites over once again, thousands of years. And so they sort of coexist where um, the pythons may be carrying these parasites, but it, it is just sort of keeping the python population sort of at a certain level, not killing a lot of the pythons. And the pythons have developed an immune response that allows them to sort of coexist with this parasite. Um, this parasite, you can see the fancy name up there. Uh, I always have trouble saying the first part of it. It's like Rhyolitella orientalis. So we're just going to call it R. orientalis. And it is called a pentastome parasite. Um, that's just the group or, uh, of parasites that it is in. But this is the parasite right here in this picture. Um, and it lives within the body of the snake. It is a pulmonary parasite. So often it is found in the lung tissue, um, which this is, so this is the trachea, which is where we breathe air into our lung tissue. So this is a parasite right inside the lung of, I think this was an Eastern diamondback rattlesnake. Here on the bottom, we see a black racer, one of our most common native snakes here in Florida. 
And all of these Petri dishes around it are the same type of parasite that was, um, the snake was dissected and all of these parasites were found within the snake. So what our issue is, is our native snakes, their immune system does not know how to react to this parasite. This is a novel or brand new parasite that our native snakes have never had experience with until Burmese pythons brought these parasites here. And what the researchers are finding is that that parasite is now inhabiting the bodies of our native snakes, which is a big enough problem because it's a little bit like COVID-19 was for us humans. Our human immune system had never seen COVID-19. And so it became a pandemic. And unfortunately, so many people have died because our immune systems hadn't seen it before and didn't know how to react to it. And so it caused huge inflammation and um, situations within our human bodies. This parasite is the same for our native snakes. Our native snakes, their immune system has not learned how to tolerate it. And so it is making our native snakes at the very minimum sick and not able to eat and reproduce as well. So that's gonna affect our native snake population or at the very most, it's actually fatal to our native snakes. So it has jumped from the Burmese python into our native snakes. It's currently been identified in 14 um, native Florida snake species. And unfortunately, the other part of this is it just isn't jumping from like a Burmese python to a black racer. Now it is being transferred from native snake to native snake. So we are seeing snakes well outside of the Burmese pythons range that are carrying this parasite. So we're just at the beginning of the story and we don't know how this is going to end, but it doesn't seem to be good for our, the population of our native snakes that are getting these parasites. Okay, um, once again, I'm gonna end the snake conversation with a couple big interesting um, snakes. So on your slide here, you have a couple pictures of anacondas, uh, yellow anaconda on your left and a green anaconda on your right. Um, you have maps up there that are showing where we have identified um, these snakes uh, definitely. So not necessarily breeding populations. We don't really think these snakes are breeding here, but we certainly don't want them to be. Uh, so FWC, if they get a call about a potential anaconda, they are out trying to find it and trap it so that we don't end up with breeding populations. These are semi-aquatic snakes and they can weigh as much as 550 pounds and be as long as a school bus. Can't even imagine. Um, I think there was some like horror movie made about an anaconda because they're just huge. Um, and think about how that would impact our native um, wildlife species because they can eat really large things. Um, green anacondas grow to more than 29 feet, more, weigh more than 550 pounds, and they can measure more than 12 inches in diameter. So that's like a snake that is a foot around. Um, they live in swamps, marshes, and slow moving streams. They're mainly found in tropical rainforests of the Amazon and Orinoco basins. Uh, they don't do well on land, but are stealthy and sleek in the water. Uh, their eyes and nasal openings are on top of their heads, which allows them to lay in wait for prey um, in the water while remaining almost completely submerged where their prey isn't necessarily going to see them. So once again, this is that early detection, rapid response. If you ever saw anything that looked like this, that just didn't look right to you, didn't look like a native snake, you want to try to take a picture of it. Um, if you take a picture on your cell phone, your cell phone um, should have GPS coordinates associated with that. And in a few minutes, I'm going to tell you how you would report these. But first, I'm going to cover a couple birds and I think one mammal. And then we're going to talk about what you can do to help. Okay, so European starlings, um, these are from Eurasia. They were introduced quite a while ago in the 1890s. Um, there were about 60 to 100 of them originally released in New York, and they now roost in hordes of up to 1 million. Um, in 1960, 10,000 of them, one of, one of the flocks flew into a plane engine, 
um, which unfortunately ended up in killing 62 people. Here's a few other pictures. They're estimated to be over 140 million worldwide by 1994. They're also very destructive to crops, especially fruit and grain crops. They can be, um, they can be aggressive competitors with native bird species, uh, and they can also harbor diseases that are health risks to humans. And it's funny because I don't really, I, I don't know if I just am so fascinated by the snakes and lizards that I don't really think of birds as being invasive. I think also, you know, especially with our migratory birds, they live in such large ranges that they wouldn't actually be classified as invasive in most areas. Um, but we do have some that are classified as invasive. And if you're from Sarasota, you're probably very familiar with our monk parakeets because we have uh, some that fly around, make quite a lot of noise. Um, they are not native to here. They're native to South America and either escaped or released from the pet trade. And in at least 20 states, there are now breeding colonies of these. They, can, uh, they build snick, uh, stick nests, as you see up here. Um, and they like to build on power poles and substations, and that can actually cause power outages. Uh, South Florida Utilities uh, indicated that it costs over half a million a year to deal with the power outages caused by the nests of these birds. They also will eat invasive plants and spread the seeds of those plants, and they are also potentially a threat to our Florida crops. And then Wilma's favorite, the Muscovy duck. <laughs> so these are the ducks. Um, here in Sarasota, I see a bunch of them in the water right on the edge of 41 by Sarasota Square Mall. Uh, so if you drive by Sarasota Square Mall, if you're local to here, then um, there's a few of them living there. Uh, they were introduced to Florida for urban parks. Um, they actually are native throughout South America, but also Southern Texas. And they were first recorded in Florida in about the mid 1960s. Uh, they were also popular for duck meat and eggs. Uh, but one of the concerns we have with them, they're, they're super messy, uh, number one, and that can become a health hazard with their excrement. Uh, but they are also found to interbreed with some of our native duck species. Uh, which can be um, a problem to, I think when they breed with our, and Wilma, you correct me because I'm not sure I'm remembering this correctly, but I believe when they breed with our native ducks, then um, the offspring are either not fertile or not viable. Um, so that causes a, a population concern for our native ducks. And then last but not least, we're gonna talk about, I believe I just have one mammal in here. We're gonna talk about the wild hogs. Um, sometimes they're called wild pigs, feral hogs, feral pigs, lots of different names for them. Um, they were brought here uh, by Hernando de Soto right to Charlotte County or Charlotte Harbor, which is the county right below us here in Sarasota. Um, oh, actually Charlotte Harbor in Lee County. So a couple counties below us. Um, back in 1539. So they have been here a long time, um, but they weren't here originally. Our only native pig to the Americas is the peccary or javelina, and that is native to South America. Um, so we actually didn't have any native pigs that we are aware of here in North America. We had domesticated pigs and then these pigs that were brought here that are now wild or feral. So they do a ton of damage. Here are just a few pictures of the damage they do. This is from them rutting and looking for invertebrates or soft plant roots to eat. So um, they will do a ton of damage to the areas where they're in. They're often in our wild, more natural areas. But I also get calls from landowners who um, are either abut a natural area or are in uh, less residential areas, but not necessarily natural areas. And the wild hogs are just, you know, getting into their lawn even. And honestly, there just isn't a lot you can do. 
Um, really, unfortunately, the one thing that we can do to try to manage the population of this species is to trap them, but the normal residential landowner isn't going to trap a wild hog. You could bring in a trapper for that, but the problem is there's probably 20 to 200 wild hogs ready to take the place of the one that gets trapped from your yard. Um, so as you can see, they cause all this damage by rutting, rubbing, marking objects with their tusks. They wallow and root, causing significant damage to our herbaceous vegetation. Um, they can do six, what I've heard, and I'm not sure if this is uh, research, but um, I've heard a good source tell me this, that they can do six years of biomass damage in 15 minutes. That means through all this rutting and rooting, they are destroying six years of vegetation growth within 15 minutes. That's huge. They also carry um, zoonotic diseases. So zoonotic diseases are diseases in wildlife that can impact or infect humans. Um, so you can see there's a long list of them there. Well, no. Um, they are considered domestic livestock when they're on private lands and therefore are the property of the landowner, uh, but you can hunt them. You can't, um, you have to check with FWC. Uh, you can't just hunt them anywhere, obviously, um, but on the areas where you can hunt them, there is no closed season or bag limit. Uh, they are very, very aggressive. So I've seen ones in traps. Um, they are incredibly aggressive and mothers with piglets will be um, very protective of their piglets. Uh, so if you are out hiking in a park or preserve and you come across them, um, generally they're gonna go the other direction, but I wouldn't get between a mother and her piglet. So just, you know, watch, watch where they are and either wait for them to cross the path or turn around and go the other way. There aren't really great ways to exclude them from an area. Um, you would have to have really um, high and deep fencing. So as you see here, chain link fence buried 12 inches into the ground because they do dig and they rut and they root. So if you want to exclude them, you not only have to have a fence high enough that they can't get over it, but it also has to be buried underground too. Um, and that can be very cost prohibitive for the average landowner. And then there's so many others that we just don't have time to cover today. Uh, some of these will be covered in upcoming presentations. We have expanded, as I mentioned earlier, the series into an eight part series now. And I'm gonna show you um, our upcoming uh, new parts. We have four that are brand new that are coming up in the next four months. So I'll show you the details of that in just a second. But here's just a small list of other ones that we haven't talked about. And there are just so many others as there are with plants too. So let's talk a little bit about how you can help. So when we talk about animals and some of this is pertinent to invasive plants too, um, but there is, uh, FWC runs what's called an exotic pet amnesty program. So this is just for exotic pets or non-native um, pets. And this is for pet owners who get to the point where they can't take care of their exotic pet anymore, or maybe they don't want their exotic pet anymore. And once again, we want to discourage people from releasing that pet into the wild. First of all, it's been a pet, so it may not be able to survive in the wild. So it's not necessarily a humane decision for the animal anyways. And then we also don't want that um, released pet to become a population problem and end up being invasive in our state. And so if you go to the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission's website, or if you just Google FWC exotic pet program, of course, they were on hold a bit during COVID, but they should be starting those up again. And they will take your exotic pet, no questions asked. So they're not gonna make you feel bad about anything. They're not gonna ask you a bunch of questions. They are gonna take your exotic pet and they have um, vetted people that know how to take care of different types of exotic animals and they will find a place to rehome your exotic pet to a place where it's going to be loved and taken care of appropriately. So it's really the best solution all the way around for both the animal, our environment, and for the humans involved. Um, 
Also, you can report if you see something that doesn't look like a native snake or lizard, um, or you can even use this to report invasive plants. It's the I've Got One app. So you can either download this app on your cell phone. The reason that that is handy is if you have it downloaded on your cell phone and you're out for a hike and you come across something that you think you need to report, you can take a picture and your cell phone, you'll automatically be able to upload the pictures into the app. Your, the app or your cell phone will know your GPS location. And then you just maybe put in a little bit of information about the day and time and um, you know maybe location and what you thought you saw. And then that goes to the FWC so that they can make a determination about the priority of getting someone out there to try to find that animal. Um, so you can download the app onto your cell phone, but there's also a phone number and there is a website. And this website, the EdMaps, you can um, report things to I've Got One through EdMaps, but there's lots of information here about in both plant and animal invasive species. All of those maps that I've pulled for the presentation are from here. So if you're interested in if an invasive species is in the county you're in, you can go to this website and look it up. Um, really, education is the most important part of this process, hence why we're spending a couple hours with you guys today. Um, it's important to us, but it's important in terms of this entire issue to educate as many people as possible because that's the base of our early detection rapid response. We don't have enough taxpayer dollars just to send people from FWC or the national parks or the state parks out wandering around looking for invasive species. So you guys are where it's at. We need all of us just thinking about this issue. And if we see something unusual that we think is non-native that needs to be reported, um, then you guys are sort of the boots on the ground for that. So educate yourself and others, tell other people about invasive species so that they understand it is an issue in our state. Um, there's lots of books and websites and resources. Um, there's a field identification of native and non-native reptiles in Florida because often you can get confused between what a native species looks like and what a non-native does. So this will help you with identification if you're interested in that. Um, the EDIS website, once again, we're gonna send you all these links. The EDIS website um, is our peer-reviewed research documents from the University of Florida, and there's a whole section on invasive wildlife. Uh, FWC has a ton of information. So if you just Google FWC invasive species, you'll also get to their website, but they have this cool poster that has native lookalikes and non-native lizards. Um, so we will send you the links to all of that. So once again, um, FWC not only regulates invasive animals in the state of Florida, but they have an immense amount of information about both native and non-native species if you wanna learn more about it. Uh, UF IFAS Department of Wildlife Ecology and Conservation has a website. They have Dr. Steve Johnson from University of Florida has great information about cane toads and how to tell Cuban tree frogs from native tree frogs. So that's a great site for that type of stuff. Um, and then we also have in the state of Florida, cooperative invasive species management areas, which we call SISMAs. So these are regional um, groups. Our SISMA includes Sarasota, Manatee, Pinellas and Hillsborough County. I'm actually the co-chair for our regional SISMA. And we are also involved in education and often work days for invasive plants and even some of the invasive reptiles. So we wanna thank you for, um, for joining us today.